though I didn't really have any idea how well received it was, I kept hearing lots of bands doing versions of my music. It's from the Donkey Kong water level. It was just like a beat that really spoke to me. It was just like, the bass was just unforgiving. It was a world of exploration. Suddenly I had all these possibilities. And you've got to try and make something that sounds like a doorbell at best, sound like a piece of music. It was a big challenge. From the rising triumph of Snake Eater, to the emotional heft of Unshaken in Red Dead Redemption 2, video game music has progressed far beyond the wildest dreams of the bleep and bloop pioneers. But a rare few of those original composers have grown with the medium, demonstrating unquestionable talent throughout the console generations. David Wise is one of those composers. From humble music store beginnings to the man behind the legendary soundscape of Donkey Kong Country and a dozen other hits, his journey is like no other. I always imagined that somebody would come in and make a much better job of it. It never changed, so I just carried on. <laughs> But if you had to highlight just one composition from his incredible 36 year long journey, it would be Aquatic Ambience. An unexpected assault of melancholy that humbly started life as underwater level music in a 90s platformer dreamt upon a bicycle ride, but eventually captured the world's imagination. 30 years after its creation, Aquatic Ambience has taken on a life of its own. It's been sampled by superstar artists like Childish Gambino, adored by Trent Reznor, performed in huge concerts around the world, and, of course, remixed in every possible direction once the internet got its hands on it. What is it about Aquatic Ambience that resonated with a worshipping fanbase? How did something so simple from something so quintessentially 90s end up being referred to as the Eleanor Rigby of video game music? Aquatic Ambience obviously changed everything for me. I wasn't writing for an underwater level at the time. I was just trying to make it sound nice. It was one of those light bulb moments where it's like, oh, that's fantastic. Today, David Wise performs his music live to thousands of fans worldwide, and Aquatic Ambience is always a standout in the set. And despite the reflective and somber tone of the tune, it consistently receives overwhelming adoration. For me, it's sad and uplifting at the same time. Although it's quite dark, it's you feel as though things are going to get better. Originally composed in 1993, 30 years later fans still flock to watch David and others perform the emotional masterpiece. But the track was never considered a career-defining hit out of the gate. In fact, it was quite the opposite. I was pleased I'd made it and I quite enjoyed it, but once you've worked on something for quite a long time, you get a bit bored of it. And once you've written something, you kind of forget it and go with the next thing. Though I didn't really have any idea how well received it was outside of Rare, not until somebody bought a CD in and several years had passed at that point and I realised that put an orchestral concert on in Japan and they'd been playing it as part of that concert. Years had passed with David thinking he'd composed something that had largely been forgotten. Like the majority of the disposable video game soundtracks from the 90s. But as the internet blossomed, the world became smaller and its impact on an adoring generation started to become apparent. I think it was Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails and he was in an interview and he, he said he'd liked it. And that was the first inkling that I'd got that it had quite a big reach. I went over to Washington to guest in a band at a thing called MAGFest, which is Music and Games Festival. And I was in this hotel room, uh, slightly jet lagged, and I kept waking up throughout the night. I kept hearing lots of bands doing versions of my music. And I thought, this is just bonkers, you know. <laughs> so it took until that point, you know, probably 15 years later before I realized. Despite its cultural impact, aquatic ambience was never meant to happen. In fact, David Wise, the renowned video game composer, was never a career he'd ever considered before he got his first big break. 
I was living in Leicester at the time and I needed a job and I'd applied to a music shop. So there I was working in the drum department because I was crazy about playing drums. Some guys from Yamaha came in with the CX-5 computer, music computer. Now I was completely disinterested. I loved playing drums. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to play drums in a band. So I wasn't interested at that point, but they came back in a few months later and nobody picked this thing up to learn how to use it. As a bribe to get people to learn how to use it, they'd offered an extra day off a week and that was it, I was sold. Yep, I'll have it, took it home. Over two or three months, I'd managed to get the MIDI working and I'd hooked it up to Juno synths, Korg synths, and I'd got things playing like We Close Our Eyes by Go West and Duran Duran songs and anything from the 80s. I'd got that little CX-5 playing those songs. And one day two gentlemen came in for a demonstration. And so I played them all of the Duran Duran Go West stuff. And they asked if I'd got any more stuff. So very, I don't know, apologetically, I said, I've got some of the stuff I've written and played it to them. And they basically offered me a job to go and work at Rare writing music for their video games. In the mid 80s, Rare wasn't quite the juggernaut that we see today, or that we even saw in the 90s. My first day was looking around this new farmhouse that they'd purchased and realizing that there wasn't an office to work in. But all they had was a builder who was building walls and they said, well, your first job is to paint your office. I was doing some plastering, learning DIY skills. It took about a few weeks to get the office into some kind of usable thing. And as soon as we'd done that and we painted the walls, I was given Mario, the first Mario, and I played that for three weeks. After the crash course in Mario, Nintendo and DIY, the true purpose of the employment began to rear its alluring but challenging head. The stuff that they brought at the music shop, we'd put into my office and they said, well, write some stuff. So this is great. And I'd got a Roland sound module, I got a Korg sequencer, and I was very happy for three weeks writing as much stuff as possible. You know, it, it was like a dream come true. Then they said, you know that Mario game you've been listening to? I said, yeah, absolutely. You've got to get your songs onto that. And that's when the reality of video game development landed on me. On the NES, you've got those four sound chips, the noise, the triangle wave, two pulse waves and you've got to try and make something that sounds like a doorbell at best sound like a piece of music. It was a big challenge. Despite being thrown in at the deep end, David's determination to succeed drove him forward. The simplicity of the NES sound chips created limitations, but that didn't stop him from composing impressive pieces for dozens of NES games, including California Games, A Nightmare on Elm Street, and Battletoads. But fast approaching was a much desired tech upgrade in the form of the Super Nintendo. I was always frustrated that everything I played sounded like a video game or a doorbell. When we went onto the Super NES, we got eight channels, but it was only 64K of memory, which is tiny, completely small. By contrast, if you've got a CD playing, you'd be able to listen to it for less than half a second and all of your memory would be disappeared. You'd have used every single bit of it. So I had to learn how to emulate that using code because everything was typed out in hex and a few subroutines. By the time I got to the Super NES, I knew all of the hex code for the keyboard, I could think hex. A lot of musicians and composers, they can listen to a piece of music, they can turn around and tell you what key it's in, what the melody is played to you immediately on the keyboard. But I'd taken it one step further, I could tell you what the hex codes were and how to program it. And it, you know, just without even playing anything on the keyboard, I could hear something in my head and I'd be able to sit down and type it. With a developed skill set and new technology in hand, David moved on to his biggest challenge yet a soundscape for a Nintendo mascot character, and what turned out to be a headliner of his discography for years to come. I wrote three demos and Tim said, uh, Tim was the, obviously the artistic director at Rare, said, can you just put them together and we'll send it over to Nintendo. I always imagined that Koji Kondo or Kondo Sound would come in and disregard all the stuff I'd done. I was just doing stuff for a demo. That's, the impression I, I had. I thought, well, that's fine. You know, I'll do the best I can and somebody will come in and make a much better job of it. It never changed, so I just carried on. <laughs> the snare sound upgrade, despite its own limitations, presented a wealth of new opportunities for David to tinker with. And it was with these possibilities that allowed his creative juices to flow. Suddenly I had all these possibilities. And so with that came a lot of experimentation. My nerdy brain still thinks like that. I'll think about things and um, I still cycle a lot because I was cycling from work home, even though I had a car, I like to cycle. 
and it's that movement that just gets my brain working. And so I figured one day that I might be able to do it. It took me five weeks to work out how to do that and code it and get it working. So the bass line was the first thing I did. It just takes eight waveforms and it plays them in sequence. And that first experiment became the bass line for Aquatic Ambience on the Donkey Kong Country 1. The arpeggios at the beginning, I could use a vocal sample and add a harp to it and change that harp sample subtly and it just gave a movement and a fluidity that I just didn't have before and that opened doors. It could be argued that Aquatic Ambience didn't just open doors for David but plotted a path for the industry. Video games were quickly moving away from being just toys to play with and then discard. The soundtrack for Donkey Kong Country, along with some of its peers, ushered in a new wave of art appreciation for the medium. But it's important to note that David was never trying to change what video game music could be. And did he even understand at the time that what he created could be so important? Not really. I mean, for me, it was a nerdy exercise in suddenly I can make it sound nice. And for me, that was enough. When I'm listening to a piece of music that I've done before, which I generally don't like to do, I just hear all the things I haven't quite finished. <laughs> Even after sharing some of the audience sentiment with David, such as a comment referring to it as the Eleanor Rigby of video game music, he still maintains that level of modesty, as if his creation was all just a happy accident that since caught fire. And it's, it's very kind of people to say that, but I, I don't think it kind of happened immediately after the video game. I think it's taken many years of galvanizing opinions for it to, to get to that kind of cult status. <laughs> But it has reached cult status, transcended a medium, and become one of the first song titles on people's lips when they talk about great video game music. So, has he ever tried to recapture the magic? I'll be a different person tomorrow than I am today, and consequently the type of tune I'd write tomorrow will be different from the one that I'd write today. So you've just got to get on with it when the inspiration goes with it. Which, going back to Aquatic Ambience, I was in the zone, you know, new ground. It was a world of exploration, so that's where I went. By David's own admission, Aquatic Ambience could have only been created in 1993. And when the result has been consistently popular for three decades, and likely beyond, it makes you appreciate how special that moment of magic was. It almost makes you wonder what other great art has been lost throughout the years, due to all the moments that have been missed. But we can all be grateful that David didn't miss his on that cycle home 30 years ago. Even though he still to this day can't quite pinpoint exactly why people love his masterpiece so much. I've got no idea. No idea at all. <laughs> and if you like that video and want to learn about more obscure video game music, why not check out the bizarre story behind an iconic Resident Evil sound effect where we hunt down the original composer who was oblivious to how far the original recording of his sci-fi door had spread. <laughs>